so uh, even though we are not a park, uh, my, uh, my, myself, I work for the Water Reclamation Division. Uh, our uh, management team has decided that it is very important that we still reach out to the public and educate folks about what's going on in the wetland treatment system. Because we still, every single day, uh, it seems like I get requests for information. In fact, just this week, I've been talking to some folks in Europe who again are looking at our wetland system and coming up with some ideas for how to expand some large wetland systems in Europe. So that's always exciting. It makes you feel good that you're doing something right. And so we've started to build this new wetlands uh, visitor center. This is what the center will look like. Uh, this is kind of a side profile of what the, the building will look like. And let me just show you this real uh, right now. We're actually underway. Uh, we're hoping to finish this. And here's a little bird's eye view of what the center looks like yesterday. And so uh, it's gonna be a one story building, although it looks like it's two stories. We have some large attic space where that'll provide storage, uh, but it sits right out in the wetlands. And so you can see how the new center is gonna sit right out there. Uh, you can actually be in the center and, and see out across the wetlands. Uh, so we're really excited about this. We've got about it's about a 5,000 square foot building. We'll have exhibit space. We'll have some classroom space. Um, and the exhibitry that we're uh, designing and fabricating is, is being done by some uh, very professional companies. We're spending about a half million dollars to put into the exhibitry to kind of tell the story of the wetlands and the wildlife that's, that's there. We'll have some biodiversity type displays. We'll have predator prey displays. Uh, so we're super, super excited about that. We'll have some live animals. We'll have some large aquariums, uh, you know, and all everything that we have in the, in the center will be all uh, animals that are found within the park. And so we're really focusing on the natives. Uh, and if you know anything about the park and the way we manage it, we really strive to uh, reduce uh, and manage the uh, non-native species, the exotics, the, the plants, uh, and occasionally even some of the animals. You know, some of the things like the fish can get in and really disrupt, uh, you know, some of our underwater fish populations. And so we're always keeping an eye on that uh, and looking at that. And through our management, we have seen over the years increases in various bird populations. Uh, you know, when I started back in 93 with the project, the vast majority of this wetland system was covered by cattails. And through the years, we've learned that cattails do really well at removing nutrients, uh, but there are some other species that do really well and even better uh, and also provide more wildlife habitat. And so we're excited about that. Here's a little look inside, kind of showing you a little bit of the exhibitry in our design phase. Uh, so kind of you guys get a sneak peek of what it's gonna look like inside. Uh, kind of looking around the room a little bit. We do have some large mounted specimens that will be on display. We've got a Florida black bear, uh, which are occasionally seen at the wetlands. Some other really exciting news that we have is we have secured a $400,000 grant to help us build a boardwalk across the wetlands. And this is gonna be a fairly substantial boardwalk. A, I believe it's around 2,800 feet long. Uh, and it will go out across kind of the hardwood swamp area. Uh, a, you'll see a lot of the mixed marsh as well. And it will come close to the Cypress Dome, which is right there underneath that blue lettering where it says Provost Picnic Pavilion, which we will not have a picnic pavilion there, but that will be the boardwalk location. So we're excited about that. And that boardwalk is gonna take us right by the Roseate Spoonbill Rookery. And it's not just a Roseate Spoonbill Rookery. We, we've got a lot of other wading birds, uh, great blue herons, snowy egrets, great egrets, uh, uh, white ibis are all nesting in this area. And so we're excited to, to be able to, you know, we originally talked about running the boardwalk through the Cypress Dome, but then we thought, you know what, that's probably not the best thing to do for the birds. And so we are gonna keep the uh, boardwalk out away from the Cypress Dome so that the public can safely view and we don't believe that'll have any impacts on any of the nesting. Now, one of the reasons I put this slide in here to kind of show you where that rookery's at is 
that's a fairly new rookery over the you know last uh, four, five, six years is when those roseate spoonbills have started nesting uh, in the wetlands park. In fact, we have the first documented copulation of roseate spoonbills in Orange County at the wetlands park. So yay, we're excited about that. <laughs> That's a little weird, but I know, but we're still excited about it. Um, but what I'm excited about this year is that the roseate rookery is actually expanding. So they've now uh, taken over and they're now nesting in another island uh, in this same general area. So uh, I don't know if they've actually outgrown the Cypress Dome, but we are seeing more nesting taking place. Here's another exciting project that we have. Uh, we're hoping to, to get started. We've been talking with Dr. Anna Forsman out at UCF. She's in the UCF biology department. She's one of the professors out there and she heads up the um, genomics and bioinformatics laboratory out there. And she also um, has what they call the, the wild symbiosis lab at UCF. And so if you don't know anything about Purple Martins, most of us are very familiar with them nesting in gourds and man-made structures, you know, throughout the rural areas around the South uh, and even throughout Florida. But what has happened over the years with all the gourds and all the man-made structures is Purple Martins have left uh, their natural nesting habitats until the wetlands park came along. And so uh, we had back in the, the 90s, we had large numbers, uh, you know, 100 pairs or, or so of natural nesting Purple Martins. Now this is the only known natural nesting colony of Purple Martins east of the Mississippi River. And so one of the things that Dr. Anna Forsman wants to do is she wants to begin to uh, survey the Purple Martins this year. She wants to document uh, kind of how they're doing. And then uh, as we go on in time, we're hoping to potentially attract more Purple Martins back to some of the natural nest cavities that are in the wetlands park. And so we're excited about that. And I throw this slide up there because we are looking for more volunteers who would like to come out and help Dr. Forsman and a, and a handful of UCF students um, do some routine walking, hiking through the wetlands and documenting what they're seeing with respects to Purple Martin. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, give me a call, uh, look up Dr. Anna Forsman. I think here is her website, the Wild Symbiosis Lab. So if you can search for that, you, you can get to, uh, you know, to these web pages and they're calling themselves the Purple Patrol. And so if you'd like to be a part of the Purple Patrol, we would love to have you. So uh, we're just starting to kick this off, but we're anxious to get it going. So, all right, so that's all I have, kind of a park update. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen. And I think we'll turn it over to Reinhardt, unless you guys have any questions for me, is that? Did anyone have any quick questions for Mark? If not, Reinhardt can certainly, he's volunteered there a long time, so I'm sure he could answer too. Absolutely. We don't want to hold you up from your other commitment. Well, thank, thank you all so thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all so much for having me. Yes, thank you. All right, now we're on to our second part and uh, where you're gonna see the beauty of the wetlands through the eyes of one of the premier photographers of Central Florida, Reinhard Gessler. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Oh, maybe not. Yeah, yeah, we Can hear you, hear you fine. Okay, very good. <clears throat> So thanks uh, for having me. I'm uh, excited as, as Mark is. Uh, Mark is passionate uh, of the wetlands as well and, and earns a paycheck and I'm only passionate. Um, but we both love the wetlands uh, as, uh, for the same reason. And it's, it's, it's an amazing place with a lot of variety. And I, I wanna show you some of that today. I have a slightly different overview of the park. So let, let me see, this is our entrance road. So you can uh, for having me. I'm uh, excited as, as Mark is. Uh, Mark is passionate uh, of the wetlands as well and, and earns a paycheck and I'm only passionate. 
Um, but we both love the wetlands uh, as uh, for the same reason. And it's 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 an amazing place with a lot of variety. And I, I want to show you some of that today. I have a slightly different overview of the park. So let, let me see. This is our entrance road. So you can clearly see the, the middle of the road right here. Uh, so we would encourage everybody to follow the speed limits that are posted uh, for a reason, because we do have wildlife crossing between the two sides of the park. Uh, we all have a pike a lot with a welcome committee. So there's always a uh, uh, lookout for when you step out of the car uh, on what you may, may or may not see. We have signs for visitors uh, for the orientation. And uh, sometimes we have uh, people, uh, uh, birds, using that as well not for orientation i think it's a, it's a nice perch for hunting we do have benches to rest and uh, so that's going to be be used uh, and that's that's something i only saw once but uh, i i had a camera in hand and so it it, it, it just worked uh, and you have to be out there often we have open air concerts as you can see so it's nature and there's, there's always sounds and what you can hear. And uh, so it's always fun and you have to know what you're going to see. And actually some of those birds are already surprising because some of them are more coastal, the skimmers. And uh, so we have an, a, on occasion in, in the wetlands and they're going to be skimming over the wetlands. And um, the, the park is the city is saying we have to keep social distancing. It seems to be that not everybody is, is uh, maybe aligned to the same rules and is still working on their practice for the social distancing. Can you give me a, a little bit on the, uh, on the beginning on, on how I started with the, with the park? And this is this. So a lot of people have just seen great photos and every once in a while, it's not the case. So this is actually my first photo I ever took. Of, uh, when I was in the Orlando Wetlands Park, and that's about 20 years back. Uh, this was before I had a real camera. This was a point and shoot. And so this is just a point and shoot uh, photo. But uh, yes, 20 years, almost 20 years ago, it's the first time I visited the park. Then here's, a, here's another photo, uh, which is a significance for, for, for myself and for my wife. It took us a few years and uh, then picked. Uh, our master volunteer, Bob, was talking to us and said, we should volunteer, we should volunteer. So he talked three years to us before we gave in and we started volunteering. And the volunteer program works that you're going to go with other volunteers and they show you around and they teach you and, and you, you join them as often as you want. And once you're ready, you, you might be on your own and, and, and do it for the first time. And when we graduated and we said, this is the first time we're going to man the EC, the education center by ourselves. As we drove up in the morning, this happened right here. So we drove up with the Prius, which is a very nice, quiet car. It was early in the morning and we just rolled there and, and the owls that kept uh, sitting there. And as we walked into the education center and actually the only time I ever saw uh, uh, the owl and, and a cardinal, which is slightly blurry in, in one frame. So this was our welcome committee. And so that's why I kept that. Uh, so it's, it's a nice memory. Okay, for those that may know me, I'm, I really like flying objects. So there's a lot of things that fly around uh, the wetlands. And um, if here's a, a, a Lee Spittern, it's uh, a lot of people consider it an elusive bird, but it's not that elusive. They actually breed in the park. Uh, they're fairly active between May, June, and July. Uh, it's the best time to see them, and, and you just have to be patient. Uh, if you wait for if you stay in one spot for a few hours, you have a fairly good chance seeing them. To get this photo, I spend about 40 hours. So, but patience. And you have to be out there often. Then anybody wants to tell me what this is? Don't know where anybody. And you can type it in the chat if you'd like. Let's see if I can actually see the chat here. Okay, Julie W says it's a black-bellied whistling duck. Absolutely, uh, it is. And, and here is from the from the other side, maybe a little bit easier to see. It's it's one of the fun uh, birds in in our park. They're very entertaining. They they always uh, on the move. They're always chatting, and when they fly, they whistle. This is a 
the vermilion flycatcher, which we had for five years in a row, which was considered a rare bird. And uh, so it came back for five years in, in a row. And so this was a, a beautiful uh, bird and we had a lot of visitors coming out to see it. American bittern are here typically in the winter time. Uh, this season, I, I just for somehow didn't manage to see one. I saw one fly by in a distance, but it's the only thing I have seen this winter. So typically I see them every time, uh, all the winter, but this, this year round, I'm not doing so well with the American bittern. Most people love our kingfisher. So this is the belted kingfisher. You can even see a few water drops uh, dropping down. And it, it's um, the best time to see them photographing is probably between August and October. They are territorial. They like to have a, a quarter mile of uh, uh, a territory. So when they first come back uh, after the summer, uh, they try to stake out the territory and they chase off everybody that, that's intruding. And that's the best time to photograph them because once they're in the chase, they don't pay attention where you are. So they just may fly right over you. This is the limpkin. It's another bird that actually a lot of visitors like to see. Uh, it could be a little bit annoying if, we, if you have it in a the neighborhood, they have a very, very loud, significant call. Of course, the bald eagle, uh, we have the bald eagle currently nesting. They're actually sitting on the nest and we have uh, one eaglet that has been confirmed and we have an overlook and you, from the overlook with a scope or a binocular, you, you can see the nest in the different and you can see the adults coming in and out. black crowned night herons, uh, they're fairly, uh, we have a lot of them and we have a night heron corner and this is typically where we play where's Waldo. So you can stand there in one spot and then we do a little competition on how many night herons you can see. That's typically between December and February. In more in the summertime, they move into the reeds for breeding. Uh, and I think our high count had been 22 from one spot that you could see. Crested Caracara, uh, we see them on occasions. Uh, we had actually one year where they were nesting in the park, actually just about um, 200 feet off the pike a lot, uh, so in very prominent area. So a lot of people saw it that year uh, during the nesting. Uh, sometimes they are across the, the property. There's a cow pasture for caracaras. You always can look into cow pastures and see if they if they are walking with the cattle. Uh, Woodpecker. So they also using the, the palm trees and the holes for for making nests and also for photographing them, as you see, they're very predictable because they, they have a certain flight pattern. If you have seen them, they, they go like an up and down, up and down, up and down. White ibis. So this is a, a, a harrier. I do like the, the, the owl-like face. So they're always uh, good, uh, nice to see. And I think they call them double cover and something. So uh, that's why I thought, so it's a double crested cormorant, and um, we have them as well. Creaming teals, the so ducks, we, we do have ducks, and I'm going to show uh, the, fam the duck family a little bit later and going to share a little bit more information. We have some birds, they want their belly to be scratched. So when they're coming in, so it looks kind of funny. Um, but they're also, I do, I do like ducks. Uh, for one year, we had for a few months a, a young snail kite in the park. And uh, we did have snails, so he was perching frequently and hunting for snails. We do have quite a few barred outs. I don't know what the count is, but I would estimate 20 plus. It's a fairly large property and it, they are all around the pike, especially in, in the wooded areas, but sometimes in the pine trees. So if you have patience and, and walk throughout the park, uh, specifically very early in the morning. So at the first, first uh, when the pike opens and it, it opens at the beginning of daylight and that's the best chance and you can hear them. Tree swellers. Uh, so the, we have a lot of tree swellers currently right now. Uh, that's the prime time and they have a good purpose uh, as actually for us. For those that have experienced the wetlands, uh, unlike other areas in Florida, we don't have a big bug problem. You don't need actually really bug spray if you go to the Orlando Wetlands Park. And the uh, swallows actually help take care of it. 
because they are bug hunters. So if, if you have a thousand swellers hunting over the area, that, that takes care of a, of a, of a couple of 10,000 or 100,000 bucks. So that's, that's good work. Here are more swallows. This is a barn swallow and a purple martin, uh, as, as Mark shared. Uh, we, when I first started, we, we had quite a few nests and we saw them frequently. Uh, we did see some starlings taking over the nest. And, and personally, in the last two years, I have not observed any, any nesting. Uh, so they, they, to me, they were in the decline. So let's see what the study shows and what they can do for that. And then I have a few UFOs. Um, so let's see, you see them flying around the bar park and, and I couldn't find it in my bird book. So that's, that's one of them. Um, the bird I've said, I couldn't identify it. So I, I don't know why. Um, here, here's another one, uh, a bobcat. And uh, so, so he was on, on the runaway. And then here, a marsh rice rat. And it, it started to complain in the water. It didn't work so well. And he found a little island. And he had to jump from island to island. Uh, the, I, in, in real life, the, the, the frog went down before he landed. <laughs> and then so he had to make another jump. Uh, so, the, so, so you never know what you see. And that fascinates me about the wetlands. Because honestly, you, you never know what to expect. OK, the next one is. For all those years, I never need Photoshop. For the first time, I think I used Photoshop. I started a course last week, uh, last month. And so this is obviously Photoshop. But the question is to the audience here, this is a tree swallow. But my question to the audience is, which feet did I attach? So the feet belong to which bird? Do we have a few experts here that want to give it a try? Who has those big, long feet? Okay, the feet are from a woodstock. They are woodstock feet, and I just attached them to the to the swallow. Then I enjoy the deputy. Uh, I think somebody in the chat mentioned earlier they're going to come down here in two weeks to, to see birds uh, nesting and breeding. And, and yes, if they are in breeding, uh, they're they're beautiful. So this is a snowy egret, and and just all those feathers and the details. And uh, so the, the, in, the, in the breeding plumage, they're just beautiful. Same thing again, this was our superstar for a few years, the familiar flycatcher. And the colors are just stunning if you see them in natural. But we also have birds in here that people wouldn't expect, like the ruby crown kinglet. And I just actually took that recently, I think it was maybe two months ago. Uh, that's on the outflow where we have pine trees and, and some, some wooden forest areas. And it actually nicely showed this uh, ruby, uh, so which doesn't, it's not always the case. So uh, nice showing. And we do have painted buntings. So for those out of state that are going to come to Florida, uh, they typically between the entrance where the old education center is in the pavilion. So if you hang around in that area in, in, the, in the winter time, you have a good chance um, on uh, seeing them. And I give you a little bit about the fauna. Of course, uh, in our pike, we have as well alligators, like in many uh, other areas. So Florida is full of alligators and they're always fun. We have alligators nesting. And when they start calling, it's, it's quite impressive when, when they make a show. Uh, in, the, in the middle here, what you see, that's actually an alligator nest. So if you see something like that, a pile like that, I would recommend that you stay away because a mama alligator might not be that far away. And, and while typically we don't have any incidents and they typically jump into the water, but during the nesting season, uh, all bets are off. So it's always ad advised to, to stay away and keep some safe distance and, and uh, let nature go its course. But sometimes like this one was just about three feet off the, the, the hiking path. We do have some frogs and actually, if they look at you instead, you, they're, they're quite funny. Um, same thing here with the gopher frog. Uh, most of them are, are pig frogs that we have. We have a few bullfrogs, but the nice thing, uh, maybe I'm not good enough to, to separate the bullfrogs and the pig frogs. 
we have snakes. Um, the, the fairly common actually is, is the pygmy rattlesnake uh, that you see uh, on, on, on the top and in, the, in those details. So this is pygmy rattlesnake, this is pygmy rattlesnake, the head and down here is pygmy rattlesnake. We have banded water snakes. Um, we have, uh, this is a peninsula rattlesnake. This is a Florida rough green snake. And um, this is, uh, I think this, this is the bandit. This is a, a racer. And uh, this is a yellow rat snake. And we also have one in the education center. And there's more. I mean, this is just a representation of everything we have. I just wanted to go to some families and I saw some ideas we have. Of course, a lot of people come, come out for our cats. So people like cats. And if you're patient, uh, you, you may or may not see them. Um, so typically, I personally, I don't share location. I mean, at one, you can see they were actually where humans typically sit. You, you never know where they're gonna show up. Uh, but I also would recommend if you see them, take some photos, move on. Uh, they, they need some space and we wanna keep them in the park. And, and sometimes uh, with the cats, it is that uh, a lot of people are interested and then uh, they show up in, in, in larger quantities and big crowds. So try to avoid that, uh, try to see them, take photos, move on and, and be happy that you have seen them. Variety of different turtles. Uh, on, on, the, on the top row uh, is the snapping turtle. This is where you wanna keep some distance. You, you, you don't wanna get your finger or hand uh, in, into a near a snapping turtle because that's what it means. They, they really have a lot of power. And as you see, this is, it was heavy work. She was burying, doing a, a, a nest, digging, and then laying the eggs. Uh, soft shell turtle. And then this is the endangered gopher tortoise right here. So we, are, we also have it in the park. But then with next to the turtles is the, is the next species, the raccoons. The, the raccoons eat just about everything. And so this is where the raccoon can smell that the, that, the, that the turtle just was laying eggs, undigged the hole, and it didn't stop until it, it, it ate all the, the eggs. So the, this is here like a sequence. It, it's nature's course. Uh, it, uh, we really don't intervene. Uh, so that's, that's what's happening in nature. Uh, it's, the, it's a food chain. Here we have an opossum, otter, deer, Here we have butterflies. The, the, the top right might be of interest. Anybody knows what that is? That insect? It, it's a velvet ant. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the nickname is, is uh, cow killer. Uh, because I think the, the rumor has it, when it stings you, it hurts like uh, killing a cow. And so that's what also Mother Nature is telling you. As more colorful it is, as more you should keep a distance and not touch it. So, so you'd be advised, if you, especially for the insects, uh, even if they look cute, you, you may want to not touch them. Grasshopper, and then there's a hummingbird moth. So this is almost like the bird type, and it it's almost uh, flies like a hummingbird. That's why it's also called a hummingbird moth. We have a variety of spiders. So again, a lot of variety that we see in the wetlands. The wetlands is also a good food source, of course, like um, this one. So uh, birds are out there to fish and to hunt uh, on hingles, cormorants, just about everybody. Uh, even the night herons, they, they go, they share the resources in the daytime. It's the daytime herons and the night, the night herons. So fish. Some of the wildlife doesn't get a rest. They get they hunt they hunted uh, twenty four hours, uh, so it's 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 not an easy easy life. The same thing for frogs. Uh, so uh, frogs uh, is, is a very delicious, obviously. And then this this is a, a little necklace, and there was a little of the fight between the great blue heron and and, and that water snake. And uh, anybody here wants to take a guess on what the outcome was and who's the winner? So is, the, is the snake getting away or is, is, is the heron the winner? I would say the snake or the heron one, not the snake. It is the heron. I mean, they are I relentless 
Hande, go, go ahead and ask. Okay. Um, yeah, the real lender is Hunter, the, the, and he see why, because the great was here. And so he turned and gave me the other side and he had him right behind the head. And it, it was took about uh, 10, 15 minutes. And, and the snake was trying to wiggle and wiggle and eventually got tired and more tired and, and more tired. And eventually it was just hanging down and the, the, the here on eventually uh, uh, ate it, but he never removed that crib. And so that, that snake had no chance. Now I'm gonna go a little bit to, to bird families. So these are the least bitterns. Uh, again, if you have patience, you can see them. In the, in the middle here is a nest. This, this was something that we were able to see with a scope. And if you went a half foot to the left or half foot to the right, you couldn't see it. So, so when I observed those um, uh, uh, least bitterns, I see when they, that they were, one adult was on the nest, the other adult had to go out, goes to the edges of the reed, climbs up and flies. They don't hunt near the nest, not to, to risk it. So they hunt in a different area. Then they are gonna be hunting for 10, 15 minutes and they're gonna fly back in and then gonna walk back to the nest. And then they regurgitate and, and feed the young ones. And, and that's also where you can get fly shots because they fly. They have to fly over the wetlands. They fly in between batches of, of, uh, of marsh. Uh, so that's, um, uh, that's very, very cool. And then this is uh, how they grow with the feathers and a little older. This is an adult male. This is also a male and this is a female here. So we see the, the, the different uh, coloring shade. And yes, and I was waiting in between form for, uh, for them flying. And specifically when they go to the edge of the reeds, they climb up. And if you see them climbing up, you know they're gonna be flying within the, the next 10 to 20 seconds. So you just be ready and, and wait for it. Somebody has a question? Somebody raised their hand, I think. Can Maybe not. Me? Can you hear yes. me? Uh, yes. In your photography, do you mostly use uh, manual or shutter or was aperture priority? Uh, always manual. Always manual. Yes, I'm always manual. I have back button focus. Uh, so I, I, I remove the focus uh, from the shutter button. So, so on a high level, in all my settings uh, are manual. Mm. I haven't learned to do that very well yet. Yes, uh, somebody was talking, uh, speaking up earlier and uh, they got used to it. It takes about three months, uh, but it does improve the speed and gives you typically better results. Once you master it, there's a time where it may take a little longer. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, there's more bitterns. So this is the, the American bittern now. And as you see from the bottom left, even so they are big birds, if, if they are in hiding, sometimes they're hard to see. And um, so if they, and they're fairly, fairly large, actually, they're sizable birds, uh, but sometimes part of nature, you just walk by them and, and then people don't even notice them. And that's probably what happened to me this winter because I didn't see them. And this is a Sora. Here we have uh, rails, king rails. Typically on the top left, that's, that's how you see them. So this was my first sighting, two of them at one time. This was on the other side of the wetlands, on the other side of the property. And then at the next one saw them this, this. And eventually after, I think 10 years, eventually one, one of them crossed just the pad and uh, I got lucky and, and, and was able to catch it while it was crossing the pad. So sometimes that does, does happen. Purple gallinules uh, are really good looking and uh, a lot of people come out there to see, to see our gallinules. And, and here are the gallinules in general. This is the uh, common gallinule. These are the young ones. The top right is a purple gallinule young one. Uh, here another purple gallinule. This is American coot. And one year we had some logistic uh, common gallinules. So they, they looked, they were whitish instead of, of black. It was quite interesting to see. Then here is my whistling ducks again. As I mentioned, you see it from here. They're always entertaining, they always make fun, they're always playing. Um, so this, this, it's a, a fun bird to watch all this action. And then once they have little ones, I mean, they are just too cute. Uh, they're, just, they're just so nice looking and, and, they're, and they're cute. And sometimes they have 15 to 20 little ones. So quite busy. 
This is the snowy egret and the, the egret family in general, there's a cattle egret, snowy egrets, and that's how they hunt. They, they hunt over the water and then they try to catch fish. So very interesting to see. Uh, snowy egret also, it's something that, that has, it's truly only getting as observed uh, in, in, the, in the wetlands. We have people from the birding festivals that come here, they blow bubbles. So they, like green heroes or uh, other birds, they, they, they develop the technique that people up north have never seen any other place. They, they blow bubbles, the bubbles attract fish and then they catch them. So uh, if you ever go to the wetlands, see if you see a, a snowy egret sitting there over the water and blowing bubbles. Um, this is the hero family. Um, and this is the, 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 the little blue and, uh, uh, and the night, night heron, green heron uh, and the tricolored heron. Kingfishers, so again, they, they, I love them when they, when they fly and sit. So kingfishers is uh, also the chat. You always can hear them when they start hunting. Wrens, we have uh, wrens uh, by the family. Um, it, it, that's in, in, the, in the wetlands. So four, four different wrens, the south wren, the zetch wren, marsh wren, and Carolina wren. Shorebirds, uh, it's a nice comparison between lesser and greater yellowlegs. So if you see them side by side, it's easy. If I ask you alone, it might be more, more tricky. And actually we have quite a few variety of shorebirds coming through and I'm not going into details uh, of all of them, um, but we, we do have shorebirds. And this is a rare shorebird that we had. It's a bad sandpiper and it showed up after hurricane because the hurricane pushed all the duckweed and make it a, 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 a form that you could walk on so we had uh, on a hundred yards, all the shorebirds collecting and walking over the duckweed and then brought us a few rare birds. Anhinga, which is fairly common. Here we have uh, other, we have the spoonbill, limkin, uh, storks, ibis, and this is a white-faced ibis, which we had twice in the pike since, since I'm there that I know of. And that's a rare bird for Florida. It's typically the common standard bird in Texas and out west. Ducks, variety of ducks. Uh, the best day I ever had was about 16 duck species in one day. Uh, currently we see less. And now the next one is, I have to talk to Susan because she said, oh, this is just this other birds. I think she, she meant, at, the, at the beginning, she mentioned red big blackbirds. And now look at them. I think they're beautiful, so. Warblers, we're getting actually quite a few warblers coming through the wetlands. And this is not even all the warblers I have seen. So even the wetlands provide opportunities and we have different areas. We do have some wooded areas and near the entrance area, entrance road. So there's areas that you can bird and find warblers. Sparrows, one of my most favorite species. So this is a Savannah sparrow and Swamp sparrow and we had a clay colored sparrow. Vireos, here's a Philadelphia vireo that we also had. Then this is like the flycatchers. Here we had a familiar and a scissor tailed in one frame. And otherwise this is the scissor tailed Eastern kingbird. So this is the flycatcher family. Raptors, quite a few raptors. Merlin, uh, all the falcons, harrier, owl, snail kite, karatara. The other small birds, cuckoo. So you see we, have, we really, really have a great variety uh, of birds. And let me see if with the uh, on time, uh, I have about maybe uh, four, four more slides here. Um, this is titmouse and the woodpecker, maybe it's just a word for the woodpecker. You see all those holes it picked? That's the yellow-bellied subsucker. That's what he does. So he first comes to a tree, he makes those holes, he flies away, comes back an hour, two hours later, and the sap is, is uh, coming out of the holes and that's what, that's what he's taking. So he has a very unique technique. And if you see those rings going around the tree, uh, that's, that's an indication for yellow bellied sap sucker. And if you wait for it, eventually he's gonna come back. Creeps, we even had a horned creep. Uh, we have the sandhill cranes, the young ones with Q2, pelicans, and some gullbill terns, other terns, Caspian tern. We have some gulls. And finally, we also have some exotics. So the exotics are here, um, the swamp hen and 
uh, also a swan. So we, we would like, don't like to have them. Uh, let's see, just very briefly here, this is a bird book that we created, my wife and myself. Uh, when we reopen the education center, it's, it's typically only sold in the education center, but it gives you an index by color. So if you're out of state, it's, it's good because then if you see a bird, you just look by color, it gives you the page. In the page, we give you more details where they typically found the park hotspots uh, with a map and, and, and so on and what they eat and, and maybe a few fun facts that we go through that. Last three slides. Uh, so here is out from our Facebook page. This is, I think, 10 years back or nine years back. It's quite a while back. Um, the most, the, the, the photo that had most attention. On the left here, you see a bobcat. And the deer is put, eyeing the bobcat uh, so be, to be safe. And behind it was an otter crossing and looking at the deer, the bobcat. So in one frame, uh, the guy came back and he had a daughter, 15 years old, and she typically liked to sleep on Sunday. The next four weeks, daughter came, but of course, that, that never happened again. Uh, alligators herding fish and a feeding frenzy. This, this is for, also not my photo, this is from Robert, Robert uh, Lee Hastings. So they were herding a fish, fish and pushed them in a corner in a half circle. And once they had them in the corner for half hour, they had a feeding frenzy. The fish is trying to escape. They were jumping wildly. The water was flashing. And, 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 the, and the alligators had just a, a, a festival and in, in, in eating. And this is my, my last one. So this is uh, one that I took and I, I called it three swallowed. So again, there were three swallows and this picture doesn't even do it justice because if you need no three swallows, they have uh, like a earthen color on the back and a white belly. And this was in, in, in end of January. So just right after the holidays, it, it, there's a thousand uh, swallows and they're all moving. So constantly flipping between the back and the front. So to us, it looked just like a, a, a Christmas tree with ornaments and they, they were moving. So this was one of the most amazing things that we have seen. And that's what I'm encouraging. And that's kind of my closure. Go out there, often go out frequently. And there's, it's nothing the same. There's nothing pre-programmed, it's nature. There's a lot of things to see. And that was fascinates us as a volunteer because we always go out there and, and in, we never know what to expect. And you always may see something that you haven't seen before. And that's fantastic. So thanks so much. And I don't know, uh, it's to, up to Susan if you have time for a few questions or not. Yes, yeah, we do. We have, we have um, time for some questions. So you could either type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. This was just amazing. Everyone's making lots of comments. And Susan, you can. Okay, there is one question. Um, uh, Terry was asking, does anyone know if there are plans to resume the trams? There's plans to resume trams, but I think not as of this point. It's at the end, it's a city park with city liability. And I think once it once once the rule open back up, I think the tram tours will resume as well. At the current time, they, they're still suspended, and it's going to be when when the city is lifting it. And, and Mark will know, and we, we have the Facebook groups. So if you if you're either uh, friends of the wetlands, join the page, or if you're on the uh, Facebook group, uh, you're going to hear about it. And or Orange Audubon does have a limited edition trip with Larry Martin um, next month. Uh, I believe it's March 28th. Check our website and you can sign up for that a week before. And Jeannie is asking, what is the best trail for seeing wildlife? Okay, since I'm not, I'm still sharing, let me see. This is the map, by the way, and then there's brochures at the beginning. And, and as you see, this is the main loop. So this is uh, the pike lot right here. Uh, and then this is the trail. And this is the main 2.3 mile loop. And this is what's recommended where you see most wildlife. Sometimes I just go out here and to the middle and walk back. This is an overlook where you have an elevated view. The eagle's nest is back here. Uh, so that's a good point. And I would also do this little bobcat trail uh, to walk it to the end. This is the rookery that Mark sees described the cypress swamp. So you have a good look from here and you can see nesting birds uh, best with a scope because they're still a little distant. Very good. And Karen wants to know what is the best time of day to see birds? Uh, I, I think it's called for a reason early birds. So um, 
uh, as early in the morning as you can. The official is, is from sunrise to sunset, the opening hours, but the caretaker, many, many cases, opens a half hour or 20 minutes before sunrise. So if you're there early in the morning, uh, that's probably your best bet. But also late in the afternoon when the sun uh, kind of goes down, uh, it's good. But, but besides that, for the waiting birds, you can come any time of day. Very good. And I just want to say that I did see the American bittern last time I went there and it was in cell 18 by Night Heron Lane. Actually, I saw it there twice. So I think that's where it's kind of hanging. Which, which is uh, interesting. Again, I have seen them every, every year since I'm volunteering and just this year they eluded me. And that also shows go out there often, you never know. But therefore I have seen maybe birds that I typically don't see. So um, you never know what you see and I'm okay with it. Yeah, now Terry is know. asking um, also if you could describe your camera equipment. Yeah, so I, 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 I uh, use uh, Nikon, I have a D500. Uh, these pictures have been taken over a couple of years. So the camera's bodies, of course, changed, the lenses changed. Um, I had a, a 600 uh, in between. Uh, I went back to smaller lenses, the 200, 500. A lot of pictures you saw came from that lens. And other, like, besides that, I, I shoot uh, uh, manual. Good. Could you describe what kind of volunteering that the people do? If you volunteer, what would you do? Oh, that, it's, it's, it's really, it's up to you. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that we, that we provide that. We have people with different interests. We had somebody that was interested in macro invertebrates. So, so he was playing in the water and, and, and doing that. Uh, he, uh, we have people that, uh, we have a garden group that's very active. We, we have a group that's in, in the flower chapter. We have people for insects and um, butterflies and dragonflies. And uh, I'm, I'm part of the, the bird group and then some volunteers they like to do the tram tours and um, so uh, we once we have the education center before that we had people that were helping on the equipment setup and, and uh, doing uh, giving advice and welcoming people in the education center so it's really up to you if you're looking for a volunteer opportunity there's a city web page there's also a uh, forms uh, but you also can come out there and just say that you have an interest you join other volunteers and see how it is and also from a know-how perspective, you learn as you go. And if you cannot answer a question of a visitor, you just say, I don't know, that's okay. And then you go back and the next time you have to answer. So that's how we all were growing over time. And then Susan Ledlow wants to know, at the smaller site across the road, what is there, is there anything to see or is there much to see there? Yeah, yes, actually, actually, so, the habitat is changing. And uh, so this has been just um, uh, redone. So every once in a while, they, they, they have to train the water and, and uh, they have to demark it uh, so be, to, to uh, fulfill the purpose. So right now it's a little bit open, but this is changing from cell to cell to cell. Some of my photos that you actually saw, the first king rails I saw were on this side. Um, bobcats, I think, are going to be here on this side as well. Back here, there's, there's some wooded area. So if you want to see sparrows and songbirds, sometimes they are right here in this area. So yes, you can explore both sides. Most people go here. And if I have, want to have a, a quiet walk, sometimes I just take the other side. Very nice. Any other questions? Maybe one hint because you mentioned the other side. This here on this side is not our property, but there's a there's an overflow pipeline lot that's here. And, and, and my tip is before you leave, check the overflow pipeline lot. If you want to see a cara cara, this is a cowfish ship back there, specifically if there's cattle. Sometimes he's sitting in a tree. So also you can look on the other side and just glance before you leave if, if any raptor or anything interesting is on the other side. Uh, so uh, don't just focus on, on one side uh, and uh, I made it a habit to always take, take a look on to see if, there, if I see something. Very nice. Very good. Well, Reinhardt, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge. Um, I think we've got lots of people excited to go out to the wetlands for the first time or go back to the wetlands if they've not been there for a while. 
and um, your beautiful photographs were just amazing. Very inspiring. We really appreciate it. And, and um, thanks and thanks for having me. Yes, yes. Thank and you, are, Reinhardt. We, we have recorded it and the recording will be available on Orange Audubon's YouTube channel in a few days. So in case we went too fast and you wanna go back and review, you'll be able to do that. So we're gonna go ahead and stop our chat. We thank everyone for joining us and hope you come next week to learn about Alaska. I'm excited. Good night, everybody. Hi, guys. Good night. Thank you.